As preparations were made for the U.S. tour, the Beatles knew that their music would hardly be heard. Having originally used Vox AC-30 amplifiers, they later acquired more powerful 100-watt amplifiers, specially designed by Vox for them as they moved into larger venues in 1964, but these were still inadequate. Struggling to compete with the volume of sound generated by screaming fans, the band had grown increasingly bored with the routine of performing live. Recognizing that their shows were no longer about the music, they decided to make the August tour their last. Subsection 1.3.2 Revolver and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band Rubber Soul had marked a major step forward. Revolver, released in August 1966, a week before the Beatles' final tour, marked another. Pitchfork's Scott Plagenhoff identifies it as, quote, the sound of a band growing into supreme confidence, close quote, and, quote, redefining what was expected from popular music, close quote. Revolver featured sophisticated songwriting, studio experimentation, and a greatly expanded repertoire of musical styles, ranging from innovative classical string arrangements to psychedelic rock. Abandoning the customary group photograph, its cover, designed by Klaus Vormann, a friend of the band since their Hamburg days, quote, was a stark, arty, black-and-white collage that caricatured the Beatles in a pen-and-ink style, beholden to Aubrey Beardsley, close quote, in Gould's description. The album was preceded by the single Paperback Writer, backed by Rain. Short promotional films were made for both songs, described by cultural historian Saul Austerlitz as, quote, among the first true music videos, close quote. They aired on The Ed Sullivan Show and Top of the Pops in June 1966. Among the experimental songs that Revolver featured was Tomorrow Never Knows, the lyrics for which Lennon drew from Timothy Leary's The Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Its creation involved eight tape decks distributed about the EMI building, each manned by an engineer or band member who randomly varied the movement of a tape loop while Martin created a composite recording by sampling the incoming data. McCartney's Eleanor Rigby made prominent use of a string octet. Gould describes it as, quote, a true hybrid conforming to no recognizable style or genre of song, close quote. Harrison was developing as a songwriter, and three of his compositions earned a place on the record. In 2003, Rolling Stone ranked Revolver as the third greatest album of all time. During the U.S. tour that followed its release, however, the band performed none of its songs. As Chris Ingham writes, they were very much, quote, studio creations, and there was no way a four-piece rock and roll group could do them justice, particularly through the desensitizing wall of the fans' screams. Live Beatles and studio Beatles had become entirely different beasts. Close quote. The band's final concert at San Francisco's Candlestick Park on 29 August was their last commercial concert. It marked the end of a four-year period dominated by almost non-stop touring that included over 1,400 concert appearances internationally. Freed from the burden of touring, the Beatles embraced an increasingly experimental approach as they recorded Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, beginning in late November 1966. According to engineer Jeff Emmerich, the album's recording took over 700 hours. He recalled the band's insistence, quote, that everything on Sgt. Pepper had to be different. We had microphones right down in the bells of brass instruments and headphones turned into microphones attached to violins. We used giant primitive oscillators to vary the speed of instruments and vocals, and we had tapes chopped to pieces and stuck together upside down and the wrong way around, close quote. 
parts of A Day in the Life featured a 40-piece orchestra. The sessions initially yielded the non-album double-A-side single Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, in February 1967. The Sgt. Pepper LP followed in June. The musical complexity of the records, created using relatively primitive four-track recording technology, astounded contemporary artists. For Beach Boys leader Brian Wilson, then in the midst of a personal crisis and struggling at the time to complete the ambitious Smile, hearing Strawberry Fields was reported as one of many elements that contributed to the project's collapse. Among music critics, acclaim for the album was virtually universal. Gould writes, The overwhelming consensus is that the Beatles had created a popular masterpiece, a rich, sustained, and overflowing work of collaborative genius whose bold ambition and startling originality dramatically enlarged the possibilities and raised the expectations of what the experience of listening to popular music on record could be. On the basis of this perception, Sgt. Pepper became the catalyst for an explosion of mass enthusiasm for album-formatted rock that would revolutionize both the aesthetics and the economics of the record business in ways that far outstripped the earlier pop explosions triggered by the Elvis phenomenon of 1956 and the Beatlemania phenomenon of 1963. Sgt. Pepper was the first major pop rock LP to include its complete lyrics, which appeared on the back cover. Those lyrics were the subject of critical analysis. For instance, in late 1967, the album was the subject of a scholarly inquiry by American literary critic and professor of English Richard Poirier, who observed that his students were, quote, listening to the group's music with a degree of engagement that he, as a teacher of literature, could only envy, close quote. Poirier identified what he termed its, quote, mixed elusiveness, close quote. Quote, it's unwise ever to assume that they're doing only one thing or expressing themselves in only one style. One kind of feeling about a subject isn't enough. Any single induced feeling must often exist within the context of seemingly contradictory alternatives, close quote. McCartney said at the time, quote, we write songs. We know what we mean by them. But in a week, someone else says something about it, and you can't deny it. You put your own meaning at your own level to our songs. Close quote. In 2003, Rolling Stone ranked it number one on its list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. Sgt. Pepper's elaborate cover also attracted considerable interest and study. A collage design by pop artists Peter Blake and Jan Haworth, it depicted the group as the fictional band referred to in the album's title track, standing in front of a crowd of famous people. The heavy mustaches worn by the group reflected the growing influence of hippie style, while cultural historian Jonathan Harris describes their, quote, brightly colored parodies of military uniforms, close quote, as a knowingly, quote, anti-authoritarian and anti-establishment, close quote, display. On 25 June 1967, the Beatles performed their forthcoming single, All You Need Is Love, to an estimated 350 million viewers on Our World, the first live global television link. Released a week later, during the Summer of Love, the song was adopted as a flower power anthem. Two months later, the group suffered a loss that threw their career into turmoil. Having been introduced to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi only the previous night in London, on 25 August they traveled to Bangor for his Transcendental Meditation Retreat. Two days later, their manager's assistant, Peter Brown, phoned to inform them that Epstein had died. The coroner ruled the death an accidental carbitol overdose, although it was widely rumored to be a suicide. Epstein had been in a fragile emotional state, 
stressed by personal issues and concerned that the band might not renew his management contract, due to expire in October, over discontent with his supervision of business matters, particularly selling Seldheb, the company that handled their U.S. merchandising rights. His death left the group disoriented and fearful about the future. Lennon recalled, quote, We collapsed. I knew that we were in trouble then. I didn't really have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music, and I was scared. I thought, we've had it now. Close quote. Subsection 1.3.3 Magical Mystery Tour, The White Album, and Yellow Submarine. Magical Mystery Tour, the soundtrack to a forthcoming Beatles television film, was released in the UK as a six track double extended play disc, EP, in early December 1967. In the United States, the six songs were issued on an identically titled LP that also included five tracks from the band's recent singles. Unterberger says of the U.S. Magical Mystery Tour, quote, The psychedelic sound is very much in the vein of Sgt. Pepper, and even spacier in parts, especially the sound collages of I Am the Walrus, close quote. And he calls its five songs, culled from the band's 1967 singles, quote, huge, glorious, and innovative. Close quote. In its first three weeks, the album set a record for the highest initial sales of any Capitol LP, and it is the only Capitol compilation later to be adopted in the band's official canon of studio albums. First aired on Boxing Day, the Magical Mystery Tour film, largely directed by McCartney, brought the group their first major negative UK press. It was dismissed as, quote, blatant rubbish, close quote, by the Daily Express. The Daily Mail called it, quote, a colossal conceit, close quote. And The Guardian labeled the film, quote, a kind of fantasy morality play about the grossness and warmth and stupidity of the audience, close quote. Gould describes it as, quote, a great deal of raw footage showing a group of people getting on, getting off, and riding on a bus, close quote. Although the viewership figures were respectable, its slating in the press led U.S. television networks to lose interest in broadcasting the film. In January 1968, the Beatles filmed a cameo for the animated movie Yellow Submarine, which featured cartoon versions of the band members and a soundtrack with 11 of their songs, including four unreleased studio recordings that made their debut in the film. Released in June 1968, the film was praised by critics for its music, humor, and innovative visual style. It would be seven months, however, before the film's soundtrack album appeared. In the interim came The Beatles, a double LP commonly known as the White Album for its virtually featureless cover. Creative inspiration for the album came from a new direction. Without Epstein's guiding presence, the group had briefly turned to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi as their guru. At his ashram in Rishikesh, India, a, quote, guide course, close quote, scheduled for three months, marked one of their most prolific periods, yielding numerous songs, including a majority of the 30 included on the album. However, Starr left after only 10 days, likening it to Butlin's, and McCartney eventually grew bored and departed a month later. For Lennon and Harrison, creativity turned to questioning when an electronics technician known as Magic Alex suggested that the Maharishi was attempting to manipulate them. When he alleged that the Maharishi had made sexual advances to women attendees, a persuaded Lennon left abruptly, just two months into the course, bringing an unconvinced Harrison and the remainder of the group's entourage with him. In anger, Lennon wrote a scathing song titled Maharishi, renamed Sexy Sadie, 
to avoid potential legal issues. McCartney said, quote, We made a mistake. We thought there was more to him than there was. Close quote. During recording sessions for the White Album, which stretched from late May to mid-October 1968, relations between the Beatles grew openly divisive. Starr quit for two weeks, and McCartney took over the drum kit for Back in the USSR, on which Harrison and Lennon drummed as well, and Dear Prudence. Lennon had lost interest in collaborating with McCartney, whose contribution, Obladi, Oblada, he scorned as, quote, granny music shit, close quote. Tensions were further aggravated by Lennon's romantic preoccupation with avant-garde artist Yoko Ono, whom he insisted on bringing to the sessions despite the group's well-established understanding that girlfriends were not allowed in the studio. Describing the double album, Lennon later said, quote, Every track is an individual track. There isn't any Beatle music on it. It's John and the band, Paul and the band, George and the band. Close quote. McCartney has recalled that the album quote, wasn't a pleasant one to make. Close quote. Both he and Lennon identified the sessions as the start of the band's breakup. Issued in November, the White Album was the band's first Apple Records album release, although EMI continued to own their recordings. The new label was a subsidiary of Apple Corps, which Epstein had formed as part of his plan to create a tax-effective business structure. The record attracted more than 2 million advance orders, selling nearly 4 million copies in the U.S. in little over a month, and its tracks dominated the playlists of American radio stations. Despite its popularity, it did not receive flattering reviews at the time. According to Gould, the critical response ranged from mixed to flat, in marked contrast to Sgt. Pepper, which had helped to establish an entire genre of literate rock criticism, the White Album inspired no critical writing of any note. Even the most sympathetic reviewers clearly didn't know what to make of this shapeless outpouring of songs. Newsweek's Hubert Saul, citing the high proportion of parodies, accused the group of getting their tongues caught in their cheeks. General critical opinion eventually turned in favor of the White Album, and in 2003, Rolling Stone ranked it as the 10th greatest album of all time. Pitchfork's Mark Richardson describes it as, quote, large and sprawling, overflowing with ideas, but also with indulgences, and filled with a hugely variable array of material. Its failings are as essential to its character as its triumphs, close quote. Earlwine comments, quote, the band's two main songwriting forces were no longer on the same page, but neither were George and Ringo. Close quote. Yet, quote, Lennon turns in two of his best ballads. Close quote. McCartney's songs are, quote, stunning. Close quote. Harrison had become, quote, a songwriter who deserved wider exposure. Close quote. And Starr's composition was, quote, a delight. Close quote. The Yellow Submarine LP, issued in January 1969, contained only the four previously unreleased songs that had debuted in the film, along with the title track, already issued on Revolver, All You Need Is Love, already issued as a single and on the U.S. Magical Mystery Tour LP, and seven instrumental pieces composed by Martin. Because of the paucity of new Beatles music, all music's Unterberger and Bruce Etter suggest the album might be, quote, inessential, close quote, but for Harrison's, it's all too much. Quote, the jewel of the new songs, resplendent in swirling mellotron, larger-than-life percussion, and tidal waves of feedback guitar, a virtuoso excursion into otherwise hazy psychedelia, close quote. Subsection 1.3.4, Abbey Road, Let It Be, and Breakup. 
Although Let It Be was the Beatles' final album release, it was largely recorded before Abbey Road. The project's impetus came from an idea Martin attributes to McCartney, who suggested they, quote, record an album of new material and rehearse it, then perform it before a live audience for the very first time, on record and on film, close quote. Originally intended for a one-hour television program to be called Beatles at Work, much of the album's content came from extensive rehearsals filmed by director Michael Lindsay Hogg at Twickenham Film Studios beginning in January 1969. Martin had said that the project was, quote, not at all a happy recording experience. It was a time when relations between the Beatles were at their lowest ebb, close quote. Lennon described the largely impromptu sessions as, quote, hell, the most miserable on earth, close quote. And Harrison, quote, the low of all time, close quote. Irritated by both McCartney and Lennon, Harrison walked out for five days. Upon returning, he threatened to leave the band unless they, quote, abandoned all talk of live performance, close quote, and instead focused on finishing a new album initially titled Get Back, using songs recorded for the TV special. He also demanded they cease work at Twickenham and relocate to the newly finished Apple Studio. The other band members agreed and the idea came about to salvage the footage shot for the TV production for use in a feature film. In an effort to alleviate tensions within the band and improve the quality of their live sound, Harrison invited keyboardist Billy Preston to participate in the last nine days of sessions. Preston received label billing on the Get Back single, the only musician ever to receive that acknowledgement on an official Beatles release. At the conclusion of the rehearsals, the band could not agree on a location to film a concert, rejecting several ideas, including a boat at sea, a lunatic asylum, the Tunisian desert, and the Colosseum. Ultimately, what would be their final live performance was filmed on the rooftop of the Apple Corps building at 3 Savile Row, London, on 30 January 1969. Five weeks later, engineer Glenn Johns, whom Lewison describes as Get Back's, quote, uncredited producer, close quote, began work assembling an album, given, quote, free reign, close quote, as the band, quote, all but washed their hands of the entire project, close quote. New strains developed between the band members regarding the appointment of a financial advisor the need for which had become evident without Epstein to manage business affairs. Lennon, Harrison, and Starr favored Alan Klein, who had managed the Rolling Stones and Sam Cooke. McCartney wanted John Eastman, brother of Linda Eastman, whom McCartney married on 12 March. Agreement could not be reached, so both were temporarily appointed, but further conflict ensued, and financial opportunities were lost. On 8 May, Klein was named sole manager of the band. Martin stated that he was surprised when McCartney asked him to produce another album, as the Get Back sessions had been, quote, a miserable experience, close quote, and he had, quote, thought it was the end of the road for all of us, close quote. The primary recording sessions for Abbey Road began on 2 July 1969. The day before, Lennon, an incompetent driver, had crashed his Austin Maxi car in Scotland, injuring himself, Yoko, and Yoko's daughter. When he was able to return for the Abbey Road sessions, Lennon ordered a double bed from Harrods to be moved into the recording studio with a microphone positioned so the recuperating Yoko could join in if the mood took her. Lennon, who rejected Martin's proposed format of a, quote, continuously moving piece of music, close quote, wanted his and McCartney's songs to occupy separate sides of the album. The eventual format, with individually composed songs on the first side 
and the second, consisting largely of a medley, was McCartney's suggested compromise. On 4 July, the first solo single by a Beatle was released, Lennon's Give Peace a Chance, credited to the Plastic Ono Band. The completion and mixing of I Want You, She's So Heavy on 20 August 1969 was the last occasion on which all four Beatles were together in the same studio. Lennon announced his departure to the rest of the group on 20 September, but agreed to withhold a public announcement to avoid undermining sales of the forthcoming album. Released six days after Lennon's declaration, Abbey Road sold four million copies within three months and topped the UK charts for a total of 17 weeks. Its second track, the ballad Something, was issued as a single, the only Harrison composition ever to appear as a Beatles A-side. Abbey Road received mixed reviews, although the medley met with general acclaim. Unterberger considers it, quote, a fitting swan song for the group, close quote, containing, quote, some of the greatest harmonies to be heard on any rock record, close quote. Musicologist and author Ian McDonald calls the album, quote, erratic and often hollow, close quote, despite the, quote, semblance of unity and coherence, close quote, offered by the medley. Martin has singled it out as his personal favorite of all the band's albums. Lennon said it was, quote, competent, close quote, but had, quote, no life in it, close quote. Recording engineer Emmerich notes that the placement of the studio's valve mixing console with a transistorized one yielded a less punchy sound, leaving the group frustrated at the thinner tone and lack of impact and contributing to its, quote, kinder, gentler, close quote, feel relative to their previous albums. For the still unfinished Get Back album, one last song, Harrison's I, Me, Mine, was recorded on 3 January 1970. Lennon, in Denmark at the time, did not participate. In March, rejecting the work Johns had done on the project, now retitled Let It Be, Klein gave the session tapes to American producer Phil Spector, who had recently produced Lennon's solo single, Instant Karma. In addition to remixing the material, Spector edited, spliced, and overdubbed several of the recordings that had been intended as, quote, live, close quote. McCartney was unhappy with the producer's approach and particularly dissatisfied with the lavish orchestration on The Long and Winding Road, which involved a 14-voice choir and 36-piece instrumental ensemble. McCartney's demands that the alterations to the song be reverted were ignored, and he publicly announced his departure from the band on 10 April 1970, a week before the release of his first self-titled solo album. On 8 May, the Spectre-produced Let It Be was released. Its accompanying single, The Long and Winding Road, was the Beatles' last. It was released in the United States, but not Britain. The Let It Be documentary film followed later that month and would win the 1970 Academy Award for Best Original Song Score. Sunday Telegraph critic Penelope Gilliatt called it, quote, a very bad film, and a touching one, about the breaking apart of this reassuring, geometrically perfect, once apparently ageless, family of siblings, close quote. Several reviewers stated that some of the performances in the film sounded better than their analogous album tracks, describing Let It Be as the, quote, only Beatles album to occasion negative, even hostile reviews, Close quote. Unterberger calls it, quote, on the whole, underrated, close quote. He singles out, quote, some good moments of straight hard rock in I've Got a Feeling and Dig a Pony, close quote, and praises Let It Be, Get Back, and, quote, the folky two of us with John and Paul 
harmonizing together. Close quote. McCartney filed suit for the dissolution of the Beatles' contractual partnership on 31 December 1970. Legal disputes continued long after their breakup, and the dissolution was not formalized until 29 December 1974. Section 1.4, 1970 to present, after the breakup. See also Collaborations Between Ex-Beatles. Subsection 1.4.1, 1970s. Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and Starr all released solo albums in 1970. Their solo records sometimes involved one or more of the others. Starr's Ringo, 1973, was the only album to include compositions and performances by all four ex-Beatles, albeit on separate songs. With Starr's participation, Harrison staged the Concert for Bangladesh in New York City in August 1971. Other than an unreleased jam session in 1974, later bootlegged as A Toot and a Snore in 74, Lennon and McCartney never recorded together again. Two double LP sets of the Beatles' greatest hits, compiled by Klein, 1962 to 1966 and 1967 to 1970, were released in 1973, at first under the Apple Records imprint. Commonly known as the Red Album and Blue Album, respectively, each have earned a multi-platinum certification in the United States and a platinum certification in the United Kingdom. Between 1976 and 1982, EMI Capital released a wave of compilation albums without input from the ex-Beatles, starting with the double-disc compilation Rock and Roll Music. The only one to feature previously unreleased material was The Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl, 1977, the first officially issued concert recordings by the group. It contained selections from two shows they played during their 1964 and 1965 U.S. tours. The music and enduring fame of the Beatles has been commercially exploited in various other ways, again often outside their creative control. In April 1974, the musical John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Bert, written by Willie Russell and featuring singer Barbara Dixon, opened in London. It included, with permission from Northern Songs, 11 Lennon-McCartney compositions and one by Harrison, Here Comes the Sun. Displeased with the production's use of his song, Harrison withdrew his permission to use it. Later that year, the off-Broadway musical Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on the Road opened. All This and World War II, 1976, was an unorthodox non-fiction film that combined newsreel footage with covers of Beatles songs by performers ranging from Elton John and Keith Moon to the London Symphony Orchestra. The Broadway musical Beatlemania, an unauthorized nostalgia review, opened in early 1977 and proved popular, spinning off five separate touring productions. In 1979, the band sued the producers, settling for several million dollars in damages. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, 1978, a musical film starring the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton, was a commercial failure and an, quote, artistic fiasco, close quote, according to Ingham. Subsection 1.4.2, 1980s. After the December 1980 murder of Lennon, Harrison rewrote the lyrics to his song All Those Years Ago in Lennon's honor. With Starr on drums and McCartney and his wife Linda contributing backing vocals, the song was released as a single in May 1981. McCartney's own tribute, Here Today, appeared on his Tug of War album in April 1982. In 1987, Harrison's Cloud Nine album included When We Was Fab, a song about the Beatlemania era. 
When the Beatles' studio albums were released on CD by EMI and Apple Corps in 1987, their catalog was standardized throughout the world, establishing a canon of the 12 original studio LPs as issued in the UK, plus the US LP version of Magical Mystery Tour, 1967. All the remaining material from the singles and EPs which had not appeared on the original studio albums, was gathered on the two-volume compilation Past Masters, 1988. Except for the Red and Blue albums, EMI deleted all its other Beatles compilations, including the Hollywood Bowl record, from its catalog. In 1988, the Beatles were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, their first year of eligibility. Harrison and Starr attended the ceremony with Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono, and his two sons, Julian and Sean. McCartney declined to attend, citing unresolved, quote, business differences, close quote, that would make him, quote, feel like a complete hypocrite waving and smiling with them at a fake reunion, close quote. The following year, EMI Capital settled a decade-long lawsuit filed by the band over royalties, clearing the way to commercially package previously unreleased material. Subsection 1.4.3, 1990s. Live at the BBC, the first official release of unissued Beatles performances in 17 years appeared in 1994. That same year, McCartney, Harrison, and Starr collaborated on the Anthology Project. Anthology was the culmination of work begun in 1970, when Apple Corps director Neil Aspinall, their former road manager and personal assistant, had started to gather material for a documentary with the working title The Long and Winding Road. Documenting their history in the band's own words, the Anthology Project included the release of several unissued Beatles recordings, McCartney, Harrison, and Starr also added new instrumental and vocal parts to two songs recorded as demos by Lennon in the late 1970s. During 1995-96, to the project yielded a television miniseries, an eight-volume video set, and three two-CD box sets featuring artwork by Klaus Vormann. The two songs based on Lennon demos Free as a Bird, and Real Love, were issued as new Beatles singles. The releases were commercially successful, and the television series was viewed by an estimated 400 million people. In 1999, to coincide with the re-release of the 1968 film Yellow Submarine, a new soundtrack compilation CD, Yellow Submarine Songtrack, was issued. 